Who's that? That's Wiley. That's all you gotta know. God, Frank, you're really a mess. Yeah. Where's the money? I already gave it to her. You gave it to who? The lady at the store on the highway. I was told to stop there and give her $3.85. That's what I did. $3.85. Mr. Majestic has developed somewhat of a international cult following, and which I certainly never expected it to have. I never expected to be getting, first it was fan mail, and now it's internet postings. Um, I never expected that to happen because I mean, it, was a, it was a good film, and it had uh, an important uh, cast in it, a good cast in it, and a really a really great director. But lots of films have that, and and they don't have this kind of interest. And I, I have seem to have a number of those films in my life, Big Wednesday and Valley Girl, and I seem to I, I seem to be fortunate in that I have a number of those kinds of films that develop um, a big following. So, but looking back, I would have never, I don't know, it struck a chord with people, but more so now than maybe when it came out. I must have missed something. Where are we going? We're going to jail. What? You think? I was living in London as a drama student, but working in America, and I had done um, several movies, including a movie for Steve McQueen with Michael Douglas, Adam at 6 a.m. I had done Dirty Little Billy, which was a Western, um, which was the backstory, the early story of Billy the Kid, and we filmed that in Arizona, and that was based upon a real uh, history of Billy the Kid. And then I had done Kid Blue in Mexico, and that was with an incredible cast, Dennis Hopper and Warren Oates and Ben Johnson, and the list just goes on and on and on. So yes, I had done several actually big movies before I did Mr. Majestic. I was pretty um, confident and feisty and independent, and, and I didn't live here, so I had a different life than people who lived here. I lived here up until a certain point, and then as soon as I could afford to, I, I moved to London because I had specific things I wanted to accomplish there. So in October of 73, when uh, Mr. Majestic was filmed, I was actually in Los Angeles doing, I was in rehearsals for a play at a very important theater. And I had been offered the job of to play Wiley in Mr. Majestic, and I had turned it down, much to the complete horror of everybody around me, my agents, my parents, everybody was very upset with me. And, but I really wanted to do this play because after all, I was in London studying drama, so I wanted to do a, a play. And um, so I turned down Mr. Majestic and then things weren't going very well in the rehearsals. So the play and I parted ways, and um, I thought, well, what about that movie? So unbeknownst to my agent, I called Walter Mirisch, who I had met, who was a wonderful man and very kind to me. And I told him I was no longer doing the play and would he be still be interested. I mean, this was completely out protocol because you just, don't do things like that, right? But I really didn't know any better. So, because I was just used to doing things very independently. So I called up Walter Mirisch and told him what had happened, and I wasn't doing the play, and would he like me to do the movie? And he said, absolutely. And he said, but I've got a waiting room full of actresses who are waiting to audition. And I said, oh, oh, okay, well, and he said, no, no, I'm going to tell them all to leave. And can you come over and talk to me 
and but I want you to do it. And I said, yes, of course, right. Now, did I feel bad about the room full of other actresses waiting to audition? Kind of, there was a little twinge, but having been in that room myself and having been told to leave because somebody else got the role, you know, it happens. It's one of the vagaries of the business. So I went over, went into Walter's office and we just sat and we just talked. And he said, did you tell your agent that you weren't doing the play? And I said, no. And he said, they really think you should <laughs> call your agent. So I called my agent and, and Walter was right there. And I, and I said, I'm not, I'm not doing the play. And he said, oh, oh, but you, you turned down a movie to do that play. I said, oh yeah, I'm doing the movie. And he's like, well, what do you mean you're doing the movie? You know, and I said, I'm doing the movie. I'm sitting with Mr. Mirish and he wants to talk to you. So Walter got on the phone with my agent and they worked things out and I did the movie. I think that I had not actually read the script prior to that because I wasn't going to do the movie. I was booked in something else. So why would I have broken my little heart by reading a script that I wasn't available for? But then when I became available and he said yes, he still wanted me for the movie, then of course I read the script and the script was pretty amazing because it was written by the great, the one and only Elmore Leonard very solid script and it was an original screenplay not based on a book the book came later and of course it was uh, you know gives me chills today an amazing amazing script Richard Fleischer Dick Fleischer was the director I was not familiar with his work before I did the movie because he was of a a different generation and then of course I became familiar with his work but I wasn't at the time, and which is probably a good thing because if I had been familiar with it, I might have been intimidated. And uh, there's a lot to be said for ignorance <laughs> and naivete in a, certain, in a certain way. So when I, I, I didn't meet him until I arrived on the set, and uh, he was just, Dick Fleischer was a, he was a great man. He was a, just a great man. He was a great director. I loved him. And he was my parents' age, so he was not a contemporary of mine. And that was probably good, too, because he had that altitude for me. He was a great guy. After Mr. Mayor said, yes, he still wanted me for the job, it was very fast to get to Colorado and to get the costumes done, which we ended up doing in Colorado. We shot in Colorado, all over Colorado. It was beautiful. And I had done summer theater in Colorado. So I was, uh, when I was a dancer, so I was very, very familiar with Colorado. Been many places there. So I was very excited about being able to work now in, in Colorado on a film. So I hadn't met anyone because they were already gone and I was in LA. And so I was rushed to Colorado and then rushed into wardrobe and, and I had very specific ideas about what I wanted to do. Uh, wardrobe, makeup, hair, actors, business, and so forth that I felt like needed to be juiced up uh, from the script. And so I went on the set and I, and I met Dick Fleischer and Charlie Bronson and Al Lettieri and everybody else all at once. So that was kind of interesting. And um, I had worked with a lot of big names already. And my mentor had been Steve McQueen. So I, I was used to international movie stars. But Charlie was really different than I expected. And, and really different from probably what people think, except for his, his kids would know. He had his, all of his kids with him. I think he had four or five kids. They were all really little. He had, um, of course, his wife, Jill, a bunch of nannies, um, quite, quite the crowd. And he was so different than you would think. He was so quiet and he was so shy and so humble and polite 
and he was a gentleman. I'll tell you a story about Charlie. Um, when we'd been filming for a while, we got to know each other. He was very um, easy to work with. He had a very specific kind of rhythm in his work. And, and once you figured out that rhythm, it was, it was a simple matter to work with him, and um, simple in a good way. And he, and we used to throw the frisbee around, and he would, he would, in between uh, setups, he would go out and play with his many children, and he would play ball, and he would play hide and go seek. He was just like a great dad. And so one day, somebody was very, very awful to me, rude, insulting, demeaning, really bad. And Charlie witnessed it. And boy, that person wished that they had never treated me in that manner. Because Charlie, in his quiet but super menacing way that you did see on film, just told them off and scared the you-know-what out of them. So I was most grateful for his protection and his friendship. I explained it to you simply, didn't I? You make a deal with me or you're dead. You understand? I go away, you're dead. I made another deal. So at the same time I met Charlie and I met Dick Fleischer, I also met Al and Thierry, and we were supposed to be lovers. I was a gun mall. He was the bad guy, tough guy. And um, I was familiar with Al's work because I had seen Al in The Godfather, and he had that, oh, that iconic scene, stabbing, oh my gosh. And um, I didn't know what to expect. I just didn't know what to expect from him. And, you know, it was interesting because because it's hard, even today, because we became really good friends. And um, his wife, who was on location with us, we became really good friends, and we're still friends to this day, Becky, Becky Lettieri. And when Becky got pregnant about a year after we did the film, oh, it was very exciting. It was so excited. I think they were in... Italy, I'm not sure. They did a great deal of traveling, of course, for Al's career. And um, also Al was Italian, Italian-American, but he was an Italian. And um, and Al died um, about two years after we had done Mr. Majestic. And it was a, it was a terrible blow. And Becky was about eight months pregnant, I believe. And um, I just couldn't believe that Al died. I just, it's just horrible, horrible. And I still get, all these years later, I actually still get upset about it. Because these were people I was very involved with. And it just was a shame. It just shouldn't have, it shouldn't have happened. I think if they could have gotten him to a hospital quicker, I don't know. But it's one of those things you think about now and then, and you think, what if? Kind of a tight fit, but it's got all the comforts of home, huh? We're not home, my love. He is. Frank, he's in jail. You're free. We can go anywhere you want. There's only one thing I want. So he gets out of jail, you have somebody kill him. It's the same difference. The dude's dead. I said I want him. You understand? I want to look him in the face, hold a piece against his gut, and when I know that he's sure, I'm going to kill him. But he was a wonderful guy. He was funny. He was so funny. And he was boisterous and extroverted and loud and goofy. You know, he was just a great, he was just a great guy. They were all great guys. I mean, this was a wonderful, this was a wonderful group of people to be associated with. There, you know, there was only Linda Cristal, who was the other woman, but we didn't, we had, I think we had one word, you know, one scene. And she was, Gorgeous. Oh my gosh, she was so gorgeous. But I was mainly with all these men, and I was there for a long time because everything was kind of stretched out 
it wasn't like a quick shoot. So I had lots of time and you know, Becky and I would go shopping and we'd hang out and it was fun. Hey, Wiley, how you doing? So my character, Wiley, who we don't know if she had a first name or if that was her first name or if she had a last name or if that was her last name, I have no idea because she was only called Wiley. And to this day, I get, hey, Wiley, how are you, Wiley? You know, it's so bizarre to me. And, and so nice, gratifying. So Wiley, in the script, as I had mentioned, I felt needed more because she was the girl. And I thought, well, wait a minute. Doesn't she have anything going on her own? And, and what is she like? And what? So I, I invented an actor's history like you do for every character, which is a private history you don't share. And, um, but then I thought, well, she needs some business. She need, because she was witnessing, I felt such horrible things that it would have given the impression that she uh, tacitly approved of these horrible things. So I thought, well, you know, what would, what would be something that she could focus on, she could put her attention on, so she wasn't always looking at these horrible things, people being killed and hit by cars and awful things, right? So I thought, she would read the Bible. So I don't even know if anybody even noticed it. But so I got a Bible, and Dick was great with all this. He's like, yeah, do what you want. That's he loved it. You can bring him any suggestion. He would tell if you liked it or not. And he pretty much liked everything that I brought to him, right? So I said, I want to read the Bible because I think that it would be her escape. And it would also give her a moral compass that was quite severely lacking. And it would also kind of give her an, an excuse. Oh, well, I didn't see that murder because I was reading revelations, you know, whatever. And so I thought, good, she'll read the Bible. So there's a scene that I, I know I was in a car and something awful was happening and so I was reading the Bible. So that was one thing. Um, and then I, I wanted to look a certain way. I actually wanted to look like my aunt, my own aunt, um, whose name was Martha Ann. And I always thought she was the most chic, the most elegant woman I'd ever seen. And so when you see me in the movie, you're really seeing Martha Ann, my Aunt Martha Ann. I never seem to catch the beginning of anything. Somebody want to tell me what's going on? Because she had really long hair like I did. We had the same auburn hair. She parted it in the middle. She pulled it back with a great big chignon. She wore the big hoop earrings. Um, so that was, that was, and she wore hats because I remember there was one scene where I wore this kind of big hat, and she always dressed just beautifully, like the height of fashion, but in her own, in her, with her own kind of twist to it. So when we were rushing to do wardrobe, and I told the costume designer, I really want to do my Aunt Martha Ann in this, and she's fine, tell me about her. So that's what we did. We had to go shopping, you know, rapidly, and, and we got, you know, silk shirts, and beautiful shoes and I mean if you really broke it down every outfit was gorgeous just gorgeous and meticulous and planned and so that was really fun you know for an actress to get to have a fabulous wardrobe none of which I got to keep but it was it was a beautiful beautiful wardrobe and then just when you have a character who's not terribly three-dimensional you really have to work pretty hard to add stuff to her. So I added all those things and then a couple other little things. Um, my fingernails, it's kind of sounds kind of silly now and kind of petty, but I thought, no, no, she has a lot of spare time on her hands. So she does her nails. I think I had her playing some, some board game at one point and my nails were actually wet because I would have to change my nail polish so fast because it was like, Oh, what scene are we doing now? Oh, we're doing that one. Oh, no, that's the one where I wear the pink. So I'd have to go get the bottle, slap it on, right, and then do the scene. So half the scenes in the movie that I'm in, I have wet nail polish. 
Just a strange little piece of trivia. Come on, Frank, let's finish it. I got work to do. How about this guy? He's anxious. Wiley, you're going to have to talk to him. At the end, or at the end of, of, of Wiley's portion of the movie, when Al, Al's character, Alatira's character, sends her out into the woods, I think it was, you know, you don't betray a woman and you don't send them out to do a man's work, which was getting killed. So I think that she was hurt, that he would view her so negligibly that she was just a pawn. She was just, you know, send, send the girl out. Kill, you know, let, let the girl get killed first and then maybe we can draw him out or let her lure him out. Maybe she'll get caught in the crossfire, who cares, right? So I think she realized all that when she was walking through the woods. He would do that to me. He would just put me out there and maybe I'll get shot and killed and that's all he cares about me. I think Wally was in way over her head, way too deep. I think she had fallen for, you know, a gangster kind of guy because he was the bad guy and women fall for bad guys quite frequently. But she didn't realize what was going to happen at the end. Where are you? I don't think she made up her mind as to what she was going to do until the moment when Charlie said, go back in. You go back in there and tell Frank if you want to settle this thing between us, you ain't got much time. The police are on their way. She thought, uh-uh, no, I'm not going to go back in because really this has nothing to do with me. You know, this really hasn't got anything to do with me. So I think that Wiley switched sides as easily and as intelligently as she switched her wardrobe and her nail polish. And Linda's character takes her and they go, they wait for Charlie on the highway. Where'd she go, Mr. Renda? He must have grabbed her. Yeah. Maybe they left. And he took her with him. He's still there. Yeah, a great deal of the shooting was shot in and around that big ranch house, that big, beautiful Don K ranch house, and then um, the woods that surrounded it. What you don't see is that in order to get to work every day, we had to go down, it was about a 20 mile bumpy, rocky, one lane, dirt road. That, so by the time you got to that location, you would be covered in dust and you'd have to get cleaned up because there was no getting around it. it was, and you'd be bumpy, you'd be nauseated, you'd, have, you'd be car sick. And, um, and that, was, that was a real challenge, trying to get to that location. We really should have been helicoptered in. It would have been a lot better and it would have been quicker, probably not cheaper. But that was, a, that was a huge challenge, um, just getting to the ranch house. Then you're like, oh, I'm finally here. Now I gotta get cleaned up and get the dust out of my mouth and, and act. So that was, that was a huge challenge. I don't think anybody really thought that thought through. The location manager probably should have thought that through. Although maybe it was just such a beautiful, perfect location, because it was, that it's like, oh well, they'll live. <laughs> So, you know, I, I did the film. It was a good experience. And then I went back to London and, you know, continued on with my life and then went and did the next film. So um, I don't remember the box office that it did. I, it, those things didn't register with me at that time. I don't remember what the critics said. Um, I know it was a good film. I know it was a solid film. And that was obvious, even when we were shooting it. But 
not the cachet that it has. I never expected that. Even, I know Elmer Leonard and Dick Fleischer and, you know, there's lots of films that have great directors, great cast, great scripts, famous writers, and, and they, they're not remembered like this one is remembered. And it's remembered, and I, I find that so incredibly interesting. Maybe it was the time, you know, it was that golden moment in, in cinema that um, there were a lot of really, really good, innovative films being done. So maybe it was that, I don't know.